It's time for Mr. Echidna's take on season three, episode six. This ain't a reaction. Don't lie to me. This is a review analysis, but hey, Priscilla uses the Yang sword. Let's get it. Guys, you're not going to believe this, but this episode of ReZero was the best episode of the season so far. Nah, I was it? Nah, it was a great episode. There were some great moments. The Yang sword moment was hype. The uh, Subaru speech. Or more of like a, you know, a declaration so Anastasia Yuli was hype. But I think episode 5 is probably the best for me so far. I think last week's episode was better, but this yeah. was a banger. It was just more of a setup episode with some pretty interesting developments. Like the after credit scene you probably missed where Emilio Al. catches Al trying to communicate with Regulus. There was but was it really Regulus? Right? Because we know that the person that we're talking to... Like, Regulus mentioned something about Meat Sack. I think that Regulus was still talking to Capella before, when we were eavesdropping. But when we picked the Meatia up, then Al showed up saying, Oh shit, the connection appears. You never know, maybe this is a similar situation where Al is like sneaking into Capella's place. And he also just picked up the media. Similarly to how Amelia picked up the media here from Regulus and they're talking to each other. I don't really know. Maybe it's a completely different media in a different location. You never know. But um, the background behind Al... That's another good point, if you look at it. <laughs> Amelia making the cutest noises too. Amelia's sound effects are actually so peak. If we look at this, let's see, let's see, let's see. Frame by frame, boom, 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 boom. Where? Where is it, where is it, Al? Come on, Al. Did we see it? It's, uh, it's got like some sort of like circular thing at the top. Other than that, I don't know. I, I, I'm looking at a, a roof. It looks like the roof of something, right? The ceiling, studded bolt, big hole thing. I'm not really sure. But um, <laughs> what if Capella is Al? I mean, Capella definitely could have transformed into Al. But just to talk to Amelia, I'm not really sure. But it is very odd. Maybe not odd. No, maybe a little bit odd. But there's these parallels happening where, remember in Arc 3, Subaru and Priscilla are together. And then Al and Amelia show up later. What was pretty much all of today's episode or last episode? Subaru and Priscilla were together a lot. And at the end, Amelia and Al are together. More mirroring parallels of Subaru as Al, Al as Subaru kind of shit. And Amelia and Priscilla kind of getting mixed forth. You know what I'm saying? Catches Al trying to communicate with Regulus. There was also quite a bit of cut content this week, but I'll talk about all of that later in the video. Now, although this episode of ReZero is obviously the most important thing to happen this week, as you might have heard, there's also an election going on right now. And goddamn, we got four years of Trump, baby. USA, USA. Now, and I just thought I should tell you guys who I voted for. After all, this is the most important election in the history of Lagunica. Lion Krush was never the same. Lion Krush. Same after she lost her memories and Crooked Anastasia wants to- <laughs> Crooked Hillary. <laughs> The way that Trump, like, brands his enemies with nicknames that's just so marketable, so memeable, that is why he won. He just fucking knows how the common person, you know, enjoys content. Open our borders to Kararagi. Sleepy Amelia is a- Sleepy Joe Biden! <laughs> We vote in Priscilla, baby. We vote in fucking Priscilla on the Yank Sword. 115 years old. And felt is probably the rightful heir to the throne, to be honest with you. But- that's that's literally true. She got the Luguidican blood, but my vote is Priscilla, baby. Priscilla is easily the hottest character in all of ReZero. Metaphorically and literally. If you guys thought I went overboard gooning for Capella last episode, then you are not prepared for me to talk about Priscilla. Let's when go! This scene gets oh my goodness, yo, this is like dummy thick, bro. Her cheeks are more cake. Like, it's not just- I mean, The Yang sword is covering the titties right here, bro. But like, the bust, the ass, it's crazy, and she is- Lore-wise, the bustiest girl of ReZero. It's funny that Nagatsuki Tape has like an Excel sheet, like a chart, ascending, descending order of bust size, and Priscilla is at the top. It's animated. It's going to change the world more than any election ever could. I'm actually worried that you guys might get pregnant just from watching my video. Priscilla made me lose No Nut November last December. I mean, every time what? I look at her, I feel like Al, because I only got one hand free. 
God damn, he fucking spicy with the jokes today. Yo, well, what's Al doing? Why isn't he going to Priscilla? The scene with Priscilla pulling her sword out of thin air was pretty badass. So although cool. Although it's a bit different in the novel. This is the Yang sword, or the Sun sword, so it's- Isn't it so, like, perfect that the Sun princess is the one that wields the Sun sword? Even the color designs, it perfectly matches her. Just red, gold, black. Pulling her sword out of thin air was pretty badass, although it's a bit different in the novel. This is the Yang sword, or the Sun sword, so it's always described as being drawn from the sky. And even though Priscilla so whips this thing out at every minor- Like, that's crazy though. This is like Megumi from Jujutsu Kaisen trying to summon Mahoraga in many different instances in season 1 when there was no fucking need to. Right? It's just like a little minor inconvenience happens. A fly lands on his shoulder. Toto Aoi asks, who's your fucking what kind of girl you like the most, bro? And he's like, with this treasure, I summon. Like, whoa, 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 chill the fuck out. I can't believe she drew this on Heinkill. Like, Heinkill got knocked out. Then she drew the Yanks or just for fun. Maybe she's flexing. Their inconvenience, it's still one of ReZero's 10 legendary swords of power. The only Hype. other one we've seen so far is the Dragon Sword, which is in Hype. possession by Reinhardt. So and we still haven't seen that shit drawn, except for that one time in the, you know, the, the future that, you know, we were seeing the trial against Puck. Wonder which Archbishop will be worthy enough for the Dragon Sword to be drawn, because Sirius was not serious enough to be drawn. Maybe Regulus? I'd like to see Reinhardt versus Regulus happen. So this Yang Sword is one of the strongest weapons in all of ReZero, even if Priscilla might sometimes use it to squish a spider. The anime skipped an interesting scene right at the end of their conversation though. Priscilla was supposed to tell Subaru, Time and time again, you really do seem like a man with extraordinarily good timing. Hmm, good timing. Well, usually that happens because, well, uh, I would argue that the timing shit is because Subaru knows what's going to happen in the future due to return by death and he can position himself well. But in these shit, in, in, the, in the experiences, the contact with Priscilla, it's not really that. It just kind of happens just spontaneously, right? And like, uh, what is... Like, remember when Subaru called for the dragon carriage in Arc 3, trying to see if he can get into Royal Palace, and Priscilla just fucking showed up immediately? Is there a special connection between Subaru and Priscilla? Or is this Priscilla's just like, everything just works out in my favor? You know how she said, like, the world is designed to just, like, be in my favor. I'm always gonna just win no matter what. And if you take that as, like, maybe a divine protection or blessing beyond just gaslighting oneself, like, these lucky moments of when Subaru shows up for Priscilla, I guess... It means that Priscilla's lucky because Subaru's around? I don't know. And then she flashes him a dark smile after saying that. Obviously, Subaru's extraordinary timing is just a result of him using Return by Death. But yes, but with Priscilla scenes, it's not really like that. There's never been a moment where we plan to go meet Priscilla or some shit, except for that one time where we tried to look her feet and we got fucked up him a dark smile after saying that. Obviously, Subaru's extraordinary timing is just a result of him using Return by Death, but yeah. he didn't even die here, so I don't know why Priscilla said that. It feels like her and Al Time and time after again. Priscilla's association with Al. Al is Subaru. Subaru is Al. I don't know. Al just act overly suspicious for literally no reason sometimes, but wait. Don't move. Stop what you're doing and watch this ad. This video is sponsored by Web Novel. Today we're talking. You got me. All right, use your fucking discount code here. Here, why not? Here's a link. You see this shit? Here, here's a link. Go, go use the Echidna Web Novel link. Give them the uh, affiliate discount shit. So obviously Subaru was pretty cooked at the end of last episode, and a lot of us probably expected him to die. Well, yeah. instead we got this weird sequence showing the demon dogs from season 1 facing off with a dragon. And, and the more I thought about this last night, the more I realized that the imagery being shown is supposed to talk about the curses. Because remember, in Arc 2, the, I, the Olgarms, I think, in Arlan Village, right? The Olgarms, you know, bit the fuck out of us. And every one of them left a curse in us. And we see that specifically through the Olgarm, you know, the Hellhound dogs here, right? We know that the curses are dormant because, you know, Roswell just fucking carpet bombed the entire forest afterwards. But the curses are still there. And then Capella gave us the Dragonblood curse, you know, the episode before that, recently. 
So now it looks like to me that there's this cocktail of curses. One being the, you know, the Olgarm dogs and the other being the dragon. And they're kind of facing off with each other. Are they like fusioning? Is our curse just like getting crazier? Because now we have the hellhound curses and we have the dragon curses and all that shit's just mixing up within us and it just gets expelled and it went back in us. What does this mean for the future? Showing the demon dogs from season one facing off with a dragon. In the novel, it's described as two forces battling each other to claim ownership of his identity. Because mm. in this timeline, Subaru still has the curse from yeah. season one. Even though he killed the dog that cursed him, that curse is technically still there. So that curse, battling with Capella's curse, ends up keeping Subaru alive and healing him somehow. I don't really know how it works, but as we can see, Subaru's leg is able to heal itself now without any negative side effects <laughs> other than the leg looking fucking disgusting other than i guess it looks kind of fucking weird and just think about what crucia's face looks like if you think that subaru's leg looks distorted what does crucia look like right now i don't even want to know the problem is capella poured this shit on subaru's leg but Krush took it right on the face. So Ooh. if she doesn't win against the curse, whatever that means, then her face might end up looking like Subaru's leg or worse. Hopefully she doesn't turn into one of these demi beasts because that would probably affect her chances of winning this election. Honestly, the demi beasts were not as cool as they were in the novel though. They were supposed to look- Yeah, a lot of people are kind of, you know, memeing on it because of the, you know, the CGI. Look like disgusting masses of flesh with weapons growing out of them, but- This one was cute. I like the one on the left here. This one was actually kind of cute. The other one looked disgusting. The one on the left, I see the cute appeal here. Out of them, but obviously their designs had to be simplified because White Fox only has limited resources. I don't dislike the new designs. In fact, one of them kind of reminds me of a Dakinoth from RuneScape, but I do still prefer how grotesque and fucked up they were in the novel. Regardless, if Capella can turn dead bodies into those eggs that mm -hmm. hatch these things, then there could be hundreds of them roaming around the city right now. Yep. And for every person they kill, Capella can make another one. So it's pretty urgent that just, she just keeps killing and then they just beam into mo it's Kind of like necromancy, where you kill something and that body then becomes, you know, your army. We take her out as soon as possible. Which Regulus almost did this episode. He yeah. actually considered killing Capella for scare. You know what? <laughs> you know how I would plan this shit? If I could abuse Return by Death? I would try one of these runs just for fun. And obviously I can say, because I'm just treating this like a game, it's not real life. But it would be really cool if we figured out a way to like create drama between the archbishops and to have Regulus actually kill Capella or something. I think that'd be hilarious if we could make them start fighting against each other, but they're united by the gospel and most likely through Pandora. Scaring Amelia with her broadcast, and once again, it seems that all of the archbishops fucking hate each other. Don't get it twisted though, Regulus does not care about Amelia's feelings. The only reason this upsets him is because Amelia's feelings inconvenience yeah, the unsmiling face of Amelia, right? Regulus wants Amelia to be just perfect and pretty and pure. If you're feeling sad, you're not smiling for me. Now you're inconveniencing me. This is a violation of my human rights. I'm going to kill you. So the reason he's mad at Capella is entirely selfish, as expected. At first, I thought Amelia was acting a bit out of character here because after season two, she kind of stopped being a damsel in distress who needs a man to save her. So, But this is a bit different. Ah, uh, Regulus is kind of built different. I'd be fucking terrified. Well, I imagine she would stick up for herself a bit more and maybe stand up to Regulus here. But in the novel, it says Regulus Corneus was stronger than almost anyone else Amelia had ever encountered before. Like anyone else and it wouldn't be a damsel in distress. But like it's Regulus and it's so scary because you don't know what he's going to do. One moment he's smiling and happy and everything is going fine. The other moment he's saying, I'm going to kill you. What the fuck? He might even be a match for Reinhardt. So it actually might be a match. Will the dragon sword be drawn this arc? I want to see it. It makes sense for Amelia not to mess with him here. And just to clarify, this is just Amelia's opinion. It's possible that Regulus could be on equal terms with Reinhardt, but could. one character's opinion doesn't necessarily confirm that. What I can tell you is that the author said in a Q&A that if Regulus is extremely strong and Sekhmet, I think, is Probably the strongest amongst all of these witches and archbishops that we see here right now, right? I'm not crazy to think that Sekhmet is the strongest. I think the author has shown us that. But 
I think Regulus is literally stronger, if not as strong as Sekhmet. And the only beings kind of above that tier is Satala and Reinhard, right? If all the Archbishops and all the Witches had a free-for-all fight to the death, Regulus would be the only one left standing. Obviously, I think that's excluding Pandora and Satella, but that should still put it in perspective how dangerous this man really is. Although, it's interesting how, despite being one of the most overpowered characters in ReZero, he's still unable to detect Emilia's presence here. I just feel like any- Detect presence. I don't even know what the mechanics are to detect presence in ReZero. Is there some sort of mana system that exists? And we do know that mana exists in Regulus. You're supposed to kind of sense the presence of mana. It makes a lot of sense to me that he wouldn't be able to if that was the case. Because again, Regulus has no need to be trained in martial arts or anything else like magic and blah, blah, blah. His authority is so fucking bullshit that it just creates an excuse for him to just never work out or learn anything. That's why he's an absolute amateur at fighting. That's why if you take the you know, the authority away, and Subaru and Regulus had a fist-to-fist -fist fight, Subaru would win. The other Archbishop would be able to easily sense that someone is spying on them, and Regulus seems to lack a certain degree of either awareness or competence that the other Archbishops have. I think it's just so perfect and fitting that, like, someone with such godlike powers like him would also leave him so vulnerable and open if he's not aware. But you've seen attacks land on him too, and he had never taken actual damage. Like, his neck will fucking go distort 180, and it'll reset itself. He'll be thrown around by the Unseen Hand, by Betrugus, you know, getting clobbered by many trees. And maybe he had the auto guard up against that part, but, like, it doesn't look like he really takes damage if you're even able to, you know, contact him. The best way I can explain it is with this video game analogy. If Sirius, Capella, Gluttony, and Betelgeuse are diamond-level players with a lot of skill and talent, Regulus okay. reminds me of a bronze-level player but hard carried by his authority? Who just happens to be hacking. And then I guess Reinhardt would be a diamond player who's also hacking, yeah. and his family owns the company that made the game. Anyway, it's revealed that <laughs> Regulus has only 53 wives left out of 291. And um, I think a lot of this can be attested to the age. I'm not too sure if everyone here is, you know, has a normal lifespan of a human. I kind of see like pointy ears here, but like Regulus has seemingly lived for hundreds of years, right? Because we see him in trial and Fortuna was alive and he didn't really change form. So I think he definitely does kills his wives, but maybe some of them also passed due to just time passing. Who knows? Or maybe he just kills them all before they're even able to die by, you know, natural age. Which means 238 of them died, and I don't think old age took a single one of them. <laughs> this episode, he nearly kills number 184 over literally nothing, and the most- And she smiled there, she's like, oh finally, this is my end of my suffering. The disturbing part about that was her lack of reaction to it. Normally, a near-death experience like this would leave you in shock, but she's essentially unfazed by it. Yeah, because it's just another Tuesday to these wives with our husband. Implying that she deals with this kind of shit on a daily basis to the yep. point that she's become desensitized. Like, just look at her face. It's the perfect face of a broken woman who just accepts it is what it is. There's no life here. There's no seemingly concern. There's no happiness, no there is sadness. It's just empty because she's coping with her life and the situation that she's living in. To it. An easy to miss detail that I find incredibly interesting during the Capella didn't open the water gate. This conversation between Regulus and Capella is her claim that she wasn't the one who opened the floodgates. Now, I'm not saying we should trust Capella and believe everything she says. But if we do, then the process of elimination is such that Capella didn't do it, Regulus didn't do it, because Regulus is too busy with Amelia, that leaves us with Sirius and Gluttony. Lust and Gluttony. We know that Lust was attacking you know, uh, Anastasia and the Karadagi, like, uh, sorry, the Kiritaka, like, HQ part, right? So that only leaves Gluttony to be responsible for opening the water gates, right? But this isn't the only evidence that something weird is happening in the city right now. Kiritaka just went missing this episode. He's gone. But last episode, he says, no one can get in touch with the Council of Ten. Yeah, they all got kidnapped somehow. Yo, is, is Pandora around? What's happening? Except what he... Also, yeah, my bad. I call serious lust for a second. Wrath and gluttony is what I meant to say. Really said in the novel is they've all been fucking murdered. And that oh. doesn't make any sense because they were the only ones who knew the location of Typhon's remains. So 
My theory is Al is going around killing all the Council of Ten in order to prevent Tifon's remain from being discovered by the Archbishops? How about that? Why not? I'm just trying to think of who's sus right now. Al, what the fuck is he doing? He's supposed to go to Priscilla. He didn't go to Priscilla. He's doing his own thing right now. I'm blaming Al for this. Or Pandora. Always default with Pandora at the very end. But I could definitely think that Al is doing some shady shit behind her backs. Just think about who could be doing this. There's no other character than Al right now that kind of fits this suspicious, dark, shady, you know, ha acts. At least from our side. Am I supposed to assume there's a completely different Archbishop or some... No, there's no more Archbishops left. This is it. I don't know. I'm fucking saying Al, bro. So the witch cult kind of needed them a lot. Otto. No, fuck it. <laughs> it's Al and Otto. <laughs> Otto is going around killing them. <laughs> why? I don't know. It's the same reason as why I, he wasn't in the Grimoire, bro. The unknown variable Pandora Otto. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Those are my conspiracy theories. So <laughs> Al and Otto and Otto is Pandora. Yep, there we go. Live in order to get that information from you. But Pandora doing that shit makes no sense, right? If we go, if we stop the memory and think about it, why would Pandora intentionally kill off the people who have the receipts to get to their goal? That makes no fucking sense, right? So right now, I think Al and Otto, but Otto is not Pandora. Non-Pandora Otto is doing this. I don't know. Or, or, this is a stupid one, but this could be still true. The third gluttony that doesn't exist yet. The one that should represent the great rabbit. I think a third one may exist. And we could then assume that this one is the one going around doing this shit. But if we're to assume that they're already dead, then that's stupid. Because again, you're going against your plans of finding T-Phone's remains. But if they're just all held hostage, then I could maybe argue that they're being grounded up, but surrounded up by him. Who knows? And what if I told you that they were killed in their homes even before the first broadcast? That means... Before the first broadcast? Someone had... What is the incentives? The incentives is right now, it's... Well... Killing them, I think, definitely hides the proof of where Tifon's remains may be, right? I think that is the biggest um, knowledge that we're trying to silence right now. And who would go around doing this shit? Who could possibly have had the foresight to understand this? <laughs> Subaru, but Subaru is not using Return by Death. But what if it's the other Subaru? What if it's Al? What if Al has returned by death? <laughs> if we're supposed to believe Al is super from the break times. Fuck it. To us, it looks like this is Al's first run. But to him, he's been repeating the entire time. Why not? Let's go with that. Um, if it's not that, then like, I genuinely don't know. I think that Anastasia definitely had the foresight to understand what was going to happen in Pristilla and therefore set everything up with inviting the royal candidates. I'm still going to die on that hill. I don't think it's just a chance that Anastasia, you know, invited the people over here just for giving them gifts. Nah, 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 nah. I think that she knew ahead of time. How? I have no clue. Maybe they have their own fucking gospel in Kararagi. I don't know, but it's really hard to pick apart somebody right now who would understand the incentives of, you know, the... Archbishops trying to get the remains of Tifon and then to also have the foresight to kill them before the first broadcast happens unless there's somebody who will return by death but our main character ain't doing it but if our main character ain't doing it there's another Subaru that could be in the form of Al that could be doing it but beyond that I'm out of guesses means Capella didn't know they were dead. Now, I had a pretty good theory when I was reading this for the first time. I thought Gluttony stole the memories from the Council of Ten and killed them afterwards because if he has their memories, then he should know where Typhon's remains hmm. are. But the problem with that theory is that it doesn't make sense why he would flood the city. The Witch Cult still has other demands and flooding the city- Al flood the city? <laughs> why would Al flood the city? If we- Let's keep going with the Al theory. If Al was the one to kill all of them, then he then flooded it. In order to make it even harder to reach the remains, 
maybe Al like interrogated them of like, how does it remain? Like, where is it? How do you access it? And maybe flooding it really makes it harder for them to reach it. Like the whole theory right now, Yoshua is supposed to be um, the letter thing. No one's mentioning Yoshua, which is a concern because with letters in ReZero, we know that time after time, letters never gets delivered well and something bad happens. First example is Rem with the blank letter. Second example is the letter that was meant for Amelia that never made it and she went fucking crazy in season two. Yoshua was supposed to have a letter with important information about gluttony and we don't really hear about him after anything beyond episode one, so I'm really worried. And yeah, Al also, Al mentioned, so it was T-Phone that got drowned or something. There was some translation errors from Crunchyroll in the way that Al was like um, interpreting that like, ah, it was T-Phone, but it was more like, oh, so that's how T-Phone died or some shit? I don't really know, but clearly she, he knows. So like, the more I think about it, the more it feels like Al is the one going around doing this shit, especially since he's also not attending to Priscilla and just going around just doing a solo shit. But how would he have had the foresight and the knowledge to do these things unless he had returned by death? And then again, if we assume that Al super is super Al, maybe these things make sense. Who knows? He was like most of their leverage. They just wouldn't play all their cards for no reason like that. Anyway, I thought Liliana's singing was really good this episode. For sure. It was her voice acting. Not even voice acting, it's the song. She has a beautiful voice. And apparently so did Priscilla because she's fucking vibing. Normally mm -hmm. us filthy commoners wouldn't be allowed to touch Priscilla like this, but... But Liliana is able to. Why? Because I think there's something more to Liliana than her voice and her song. I think that she may have some sort of divine protection or blessing. Or some sort of skill that's inactivated by using her magic like a bard. I think she's enchanting everybody and this isn't just like compelling people through just music alone. For some reason Liliana gets away with it. Even Al can't touch her without being physically assaulted. And True. speaking of Al, it seems like he fails the try not to be suspicious challenge every episode. Yeah. Remember he casually mentions Typhon the Witch of Pride whose identity was supposed yeah. to be a taboo that nobody knows that much about. And then he randomly told us the secret to countering Gluttony's authority before anyone even knew that Gluttony was in the city. And this episode, in the after credit scene, Al fucking dials up Regulus and gives him a call. Why? Why? Right? Well, Al didn't dial up Regulus, did he? Mm, it was kind of... I don't know how the media really works. Who opened it first? Al said, oh, there is a signal. Amelia simply opened it. And then Al said, oh, there is a signal. So I think that does imply that Al is the one that initiated that call. Or as... Uh, uh, unless both were just simply opening at the same time and just ha the act of opening is somehow connects it, I'm not really sure. But like, are we then supposed to assume Al is in your capella right now? Is it a one-to-one -one connection where instead of Sirius or Gluttony, like, like there's multiple meteors for this shit, right? I thought it's like a one-to-many relationship rather than one-to-one, -one, but either, either way, it still can be Capella's location. And he just shows up? I know for a fact Regulus is talking to Capella. Regulus is not talking to Al the entire time. You could assume that Capella transformed into Al, but for what reason would, he, would she ever do that? I don't know, but that definitely can't be left out. It's also a troll that not only is it Capella that can transform into other people, you know, Pandora can too, but this is, this is crazy. I, 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 I fail to recognize how Capella disguises Al right now would help anything. Unless that you knew, like, Al, like, Capella had the knowledge that Al is Priscilla's knight and that Capella was trying to then spin this false narrative of uh, making Al seem like a traitor amongst the royal candidates to create divide amongst them. I, other than that, what incentive would Capella have to change into Al there if we're going to even entertain that thought? Why does Al have a witch cult communication device, and why did he call Regulus? And also, the obvious question that I don't see anyone else asking, why hasn't he ever taken off his helmet? What is he a f Well, the excuse is that his face is super disfigured, and that you wouldn't want to show other people disfigured faces. In fact, maybe we need to get one of these helmets for Krush pretty soon. Why is there no meme of that yet? Krush in Al's helmet, bro. <laughs> 
fucking Mandalorian? Does everything about this guy just have to be shady and secretive? Even his face? For all I know, he could have a second arm still, somehow. I just don't trust anything. It's his dick. Yeah, no, I think it's a stump. Then again, we never really saw the stump, so we can't be completely sure. Maybe he is hiding his fucking... <laughs> Imagine the biggest... <laughs> The biggest troll is that he was baiting, like he was always just hiding a second arm like this in, instead of just like, you know, being a stump. He just always just like hid his under his clothing, just walked around like this the entire time. <laughs> That'd be fucking crazy. Thing about this man, and please, guys, if you're an anime only, don't yeah. spoil yourself by reading Al's wiki page. It's I not worth it. I know you're curious, but it's better that way. Trust me. The it is so pointless and stupid to go to the wiki page and read Al's stuff. Because you're ruining the orgasm that's going to happen. Why would you intentionally ruin the climax of something that's been building up for so well, bro? I will. Because that's why I hate fucking spoilers so much. And that's why it also is so stupid when people say like pre-watch. It's just like, do you really think that after being invested into the show this much that I would intentionally ruin all that fucking shit? All the amazing moments and the pop-up moment that's going to be so much better if it's like an authentic, genuine first time reaction? What, in order to just like seem impressive on predictions to monkeys on YouTube? You are so delusional if you think I'm going to take my fucking free time to spoil myself to look good to you. Crazy shit. It's even better, actually, if you're wrong about the theories. The thing about reaction content and having fun is being right and predicting crazy shit, that's not necessarily fun. In fact, I would argue that that, that kind of like places more suspicion on you unless you have the logic to build that shit up. In fact, going with schizo theories and going down completely stupid theories and the chat being like, oh, bro doesn't know, bro doesn't know. That's even more fun. And then when you, you know, the stupid theory gets debunked and some other shock happens, that's so much more fun. All that matters to me is that the reactions are entertaining, not trying to be a know-it-all that defeats the purpose. I want to do my due diligence and understand what's going on, but at the same time, make these shitty dumb theories. And then sometimes I'm right. Most of the times I'm wrong, but that's way more fun than just predicting shit out of fucking thin air and then having people be like, how did you know that? The best way to experience ReZero is naturally. This week's episode of Break Time continued last week's conversation between Al and Subaru, and yep. now Beatrice knows that Subaru is from Japan, which I thought was pretty interesting. I really loved the lighting this episode, and some of these shots were just amazing. I thought it was kinda dumb how Subaru's shoe and his pants grew back. Yeah, so how did that happen? And I thought it was similar to Capella's power of, you know how she was changing forms, but the clothing was also changing. And later on, we discovered that it's basically um, all her clothing. It's she's naked. But it's her authority, it's her power. So the clothing just kind of comes with it. It's like the same shit in Demon Slayer, like Muzan. Completely random shit, right? But Muzan, bro, um, you know how he like changes forms and his suit comes out of fucking nowhere. Like all of that is basically his cells. So you could assume the same shit here, that the shoes, that tattered bandage and everything, this is all basically the dragon cursed blood regeneration powers of restoring the state it was before. It's not actual clothing per se, even though it's clothing. I'm not really sure about that, but it's the same concept I think of why Capella was changing forms and different clothing, you know, appearances were changing, not just her skin along with his leg, but whatever. Next week's episode will be one of the most important ReZero episodes of all time, so... Oh, priority episode incoming? The penultimate episode and the finale is coming up, right? We got two left. But make sure you subscribe to me so you don't miss that. Thanks for watching. You guys can hit the like button too. Yes, sir. I'ma like this shit, and you guys should too. Please go check out Mr. Echidnut's video. Here's the link. Please go give it a like and share it if you want. Check out his channel. That was a great cover. And what is the most important things that we learned today or like the new theories that we have? Um, let's keep in mind of who opened the floodgates, who killed the Pristilla 10. And before the first broadcast was happening, I think uh, one of the new theories that we kind of spun up today is that Al is the one that is going around doing this shit and perhaps that he does have return by death in a different way, kind of like Subaru does, because if we're supposed to assume Subaru is Al and Al is Subaru from different timelines, maybe this makes sense. That's it from me. Bye-bye.